My name is Michael Hemp. I'm uh, an accidental historian. Uh, I was born in Berkeley, California on December 23rd, 1942. Uh, raised in Berkeley, uh, educated at St. Mary's High School, two years at Gonzaga University, and I finished back home at Cal Berkeley in international relations. Uh, time as a special intelligence officer at SAC headquarters to three commander in chiefs. Uh, a tour to uh, Laos, Cambodia, and uh, both Vietnams uh, before I got out of the Air Force as a, uh, a special uh, intelligence uh, officer. And I settled in, ultimately, in uh, Monterey, California, uh, Pacific Grove to be specific, um, and got an assignment for the risky job that I'd taken down here, uh, Monterey Life Magazine, to do a history, just do a little uh, a digest version of a quick history of Cannery Row as a sidebar to the magazine. They were going to blow the little booklet in. And that assignment took me uh, to where I am right now because I found out in stepping onto the street in 1980-81, what I had already known since 1979, there wasn't a history book. There literally, literally wasn't a history book that you could go to for any verifiable or substantial information on John Steinbeck, uh, certainly not Ed Ricketts, uh, nothing on the cannery workers. Um, Bad journalism had passed for history for decades, and I had the opportunity to either stay or go, and I decided to stay. Um, to make a sh story somewhat shorter, I created the Cannery Row Foundation in 1983 for very um, jealous reasons. I wanted to be its historian, and that's what I've become. And the last uh, almost 30 years now, my passion has been Cannery Row. It's been a great place to be in, and I would like to say at the beginning, I would like to invite anybody with a historical interest, especially students who are going to be making up their minds about what kind of theses and papers are they going to, going to be doing on the way to their, their MAs and their, their PhDs. Cannery Row, Monterey, I can attest, is the least stepped on, and I use that term very specifically in terms of historical research. Fewer historians have stepped on the, the original research uh, of Cannery Row, John Steinbeck, and the fishing and canning industry here than probably any other major topic in American history. So I invite you all aboard. January of 1958, the city of Monterey caved in and called it officially Cannery Row. But all those other years, it was named Ocean View Avenue. And the name of my history book uh, is Cannery Row, John Steinbeck's old Ocean View Avenue, with the emphasis on Ocean View Avenue. For those of you who know about uh, a little bit about the area, Ocean View Boulevard continues on into Pacific Grove. It's an extension of the same street, but it was before unions. In the mid-1930s, I think uh, Joe Bragdon, in one of his comments in, a, in another interview in this series, said he was making 57 cents an hour as a union laborer. Well, that was a lot better than 35 cents an hour uh, before the unions, uh, which came in the late 1930s. But there was no such thing as an eight-hour day or a five-day week. This community depended on sardines, the fishing, the canning, and the selling, and the marketing, and the supplying of everybody involved in that process, uh, half a year. And interestingly enough, one of the subjects, here's a, here's a case for a, a, a thesis, how did Monterey end up with a, um, a credit economy for half a year, half of every year, the entire system in Monterey ran on a credit system, an unofficial credit system before credit cards were ever thought of, before contracts were ever drawn. You owed the marketplace, you owed the shoemaker, you owed everybody half a year until the fish came back. The cannery started in, in August and ran until February. You made your money, paid off all your bills, and then it started all over again. Very interesting a financial feature for those of you who want to go into um, a, a different kind of financial pursuit. Uh, first of all, let's, t let's deal with the canneries. Uh, World War I actually mechanized the, the canning industry. That provided the impetus and the investment to actually put Cannery Row and Monterey on the map. The, uh, and not only in the First World War, but the Second World War, the German Navy interrupted the, the fishing grounds in the North Sea, and of course the world turned elsewhere for a, a cheap, plentiful uh, ration for both the populace and, uh, and armies on foot. And it turned out to be the Monterey Sardine, in, in large part. And so huge fortunes were made in both World War I and World War II in the sardine business. Right after World War I, there was a recession. Uh, it, they limped through the 20s, started looking good, and all of a sudden, 1929 ended all that, and America started the Great Depression. Uh, Cannery Row survived it all. Working conditions, as I said earlier, were Dickinsonian. I mean, some talk, if you can conceive of Rube Goldberg-type uh, uh, machines, 
many of which were, were carryovers from when Cannery Row started as a steam-driven, boiler-driven industry that had gradually converted over to electric power uh, in combination with steam. There were gears, wheels, gear sets. There were, there were dangerous things everywhere in every cannery. And if you got injured or uh, lost a finger, broke an arm, uh, you were basically on the doles. There was no safety net in this industry. Especially during the 1930s, uh, 35 cents an hour was basically survival, and in some cases it wasn't. But whole families uh, were working in the canneries. Each cannery had contracted boats, and they would arrive before dawn after fishing all night for the sardines in Monterey Bay. And the whistles would go off calling cannery workers down to, the, to their canneries even before the sun came up. The people actually told me time and time again, yes, they could pick out their cannery whistle the signal from their cannery amongst a chorus of 24 other canneries in their sleep. They knew when it was their turn. They put on their, their, uh, their, their clo work clothes and, and uh, aprons and, and went down the hill from New Monterey into the canneries. They would be there, the women at the canning lines, the men in the warehouses, the seamers and the, and the boilers and the rest of it, for eight hours if it took that long to unload the, the boats assigned or contracted to that cannery, or it could be 18 hours. And then the whistle would go and you can go home and it started all over again. That was life here on Cannery Row. Uh, it, was, it was brutal stuff in these cold, drafty canneries, no safety nets. But after one of the things I found after so many interviews, time and time again, these old timers would tell me with a little, a little gleam in their eye that if the, if the whistles called them, they'd go again. And they'd go because of the people that, that made that business click. And we found out that Monterey is probably the most uh, probably the best example of the most homogeneous multi-ethnic workforce in industrial American history. You can take the East Coast and you have gang wars, tong wars, there, people lived in barrios, it was war, open warfare in this industrial, this hangover from the, industri the early industrial age. Here in Monterey, the 1926 maps actually not only showed uh, who lived where, the number of the house, the building, they actually said what nationality. So an American would be next to a Norwegian, living next to a Spanish, living next to a Japanese, Japanese, Chinese, Norwegian, Scotch. Um, uh, that's the way it was on Cannery Row. There was no real segregation on Cannery Row, either in the neighborhood or on the canning lines. Uh, certain nationalities, nationalities specialized in certain things, like the the early uh, uh, Chinese and uh, Spanish, and uh, some of the Portuguese women were excellent. They were, they were expert uh, flensing, with their flensing knives as cutters, hand cutters. They got paid piecemeal, so if you were a good cutter, you made a pretty good uh, rate compared to the rest of the poor folks that were paid based on the number of fish that ended up in the bucket in front of them. Uh, the, the canning uh, mechanization resulted in um, automatic cutting machines that anybody could operate. That took over very quickly, and so they could hire anybody to slap fish in a, in a conveyor that dragged them under spinning knives that cut off the heads and tails and knocked the guts out and sent them down to the canning lines. A couple of things about the fish. We took about 200,000 tons on average out of the coastal waters here in a season in the 30s and into the 1940s. That's about a billion sardines, roughly. And the big secret here is that two-thirds of them never saw a can at all. They were turned into fish meal and fertilizer in a, in a reduction process that stunk up Monterey so much it became famous. That was part of a th uh, the theme of a saying of the times, uh, Carmel by the sea because it was so beautiful, Pacific Grove by God because it had more churches per capita than anywhere else in the country, I think, and Monterey by the smell. And it was a joke, but it was actually, there was, a, there was a point to it. It was the smell of prosperity. We were turning two-thirds of those sardines in a, in a process that caused this horrendous stench, a death-like odor that wafted over the entire peninsula six months of the year in an industry that ostensibly was canning fish. Actually, we had to can as little as 11 and a half cases per tons of sardines. The rest of it was all diverted into making fish meal and fertilizer. That was the secret of Cannery Row. Five men could run a plant doing that that made more money for a canner and his investors than a hundred women on the canning lines, men at the, the boilers, the reduction line, the, the rest of the, the canning and warehousing for a country that didn't eat fish. We just, we have never been a, a canned fish eating nation. And when we had to sell it overseas, 
uh, the canning industry here in Monterey was facing international subsidized national competition in those markets. So it was not it was not a cakewalk ever, except during the two world wars when things went absolutely crazy. During the Second World War in, 19, uh, in the in early 40s, we actually produced more tonnage in one year than Stavanger, Norway, which actually is the real sardine capital of the world. But we copped it one year and we never gave the title back. The Monterey sardine is not your figure size sardine from Norway. It um, started out about 11 inches. And as we took more and more of them, the fat, oily, uh, mature, uh, sexually reproductive, capable sardines out of this biomass, uh, the sardines kept on getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And in the late 1930s, a whole fleet of ships offshore uh, were there just to turn sardines into fish meal. They didn't can anything, but they were beyond the, uh, the, the legal limit. And in the matter of three or four years, we took twice as many fish out of the biomass as the biologist figure could, it could support. Along came World War II, and we really did a job on them uh, with all of our patriotic fervor. And in 10 years, from 1941 to 1951, we fell from around 200,000 tons of fish in a season uh, to about 30,000 tons. We had helped them out of a, of a cycle that we know the sardines are in. It's a, his, it's a his, historically cyclical appearance. They come and they go over an extended period of historic time. We certainly helped them out of that uh, cycle. Um, there's no doubt about that. And for a number of complex reasons now, that not just overfishing, which I still adhere to, has got to be one of the absolutely major reasons, but we do know a lot more now about uh, La Nina, El Nino, the distribution of currents and temperatures, uh, the addition of DDT into the Salinas Valley in 1947. A lot of things combined to put the kibosh on this, the sardines in that particular period. Uh, it is of some interest, though, that the sardines are back. They are back out in Monterey Bay occasionally in uh, commercial quantities, but we still can't fish, we can't catch them, we can't can them, market them, and, uh, and, and, and uh, produce them economically against uh, the nation still in the big steel ships at sea that do all of this production uh, without ever uh, uh, touching a port until they return and, and unload case packages of cases of sardines.